currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote council session. Due to the current public health emergency, City Council is currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make this remote meeting possible. Instructions for how the public may view the meeting and offer public comment are included in the stated meeting notice that was published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the meeting and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. I now note that the hour has come. The clerk will please call a roll to take attendance and obviously members uh, say a couple of words to make sure uh, that your name is displayed on the screen. Mr. Decker, please call the roll. Councilwoman Bass. Good morning, Mr. President and colleagues. Looking forward to a productive day. Good morning, Council Lady. Good morning. Councilwoman Brooks. Good morning, Council President and colleagues. Good morning, Council Lady. Councilman Dom. Good morning, Council President and colleagues and the public. Good morning, Councilman. Councilwoman Gautier. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, Council Lady. Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, Council Lady. Councilman Green. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, members of Council. Good morning, viewing public. Looking forward to another productive session. Good morning, Councilman. Councilwoman Gim. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, Council Lady. Councilman Heenan. Good morning, Council President. And good morning, colleagues. Good morning, Councilman. Councilman Johnson. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, colleagues. Still seeking justice for Brianna Taylor. Good morning, Councilman. Councilman Jones. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, viewing public. Good morning, Council. Councilman O. Good morning. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, Councilman. Councilman O'Neill. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Councilman. Councilwoman Parker. Good morning, Mr. President and colleagues. Good morning, Council Lady. Councilwoman Kenone Sanchez. Good morning, President um, Clark and my colleagues, and I'm enjoying this wonderful weather. Good morning, Council Lady. Councilman Squilla. Mark. <laughs> Councilman Squilla. Councilman Thomas. Good morning, Council President. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, happy Thursday, everybody. Good morning, Councilman. Council President Clark. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we've established a quorum, so we're going to get started. Um, normally, uh, we would have our invocation today, uh, but we will, however, observe a very brief moment of silent prayer for our city, its leaders, and citizens during the current public health crisis. Uh, let's now take a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Our next order of business is the approval of the journal of the meeting of Thursday, October 15, 2020. And the chair recognizes, is Councilman School on yet? Chair recognizes Councilwoman Jones. Jones, go ahead, Councilman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move that the journal uh, of the meeting Thursday, October 15, 2020 be approved. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and properly second that the journal of the meeting of Thursday, October 15, 2020, stand approved. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, ayes have it, and that journal is approved. And our next order of business is request for leave of absence, and the chair recognizes Councilwoman Parker. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the members of council, there are no requests for leaves of absence today. Thank you, Chair. 
Thanks to Council Lady. And our next order of business is communications. Uh, Mr. Decker, will you please read the messages from the mayor and any other communication that you may have in your possession? To the president and members of the Council of the City of Philadelphia, I am transmitting herewith to the consideration of your honorable body an ordinance authorizing the revision of lines of grades in a portion of city plan number 46S by striking from the city plan and vacating Penrose Ferry Road from Penrose Avenue to its terminus northeastwardly therefrom and reserving and placing on the city plan a right of way for various public utility purposes within the lines of Penrose Ferry Road being stricken and authorizing acceptance of the grant to the city of the said right of way being reserved all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you very much, Mr. Decker. And our next order of business is the introduction of bills and resolutions. And by way of a reminder, uh, we are asking that all resolutions included privileged resolutions be placed on the final passes calendar for the next session of council, unless they are being referred to committee. Um, in our current remote environment, this procedure will provide an opportunity for the public to comment. Uh, thank you in advance for your anticipated cooperation. And Mr. Decker, would you please read the titles of the legislation that is being offered today by the members? Councilwoman Parker offers on behalf of Council President Clark an ordinance to amend the Philadelphia zoning maps by changing the zoning designation of certain areas of land located within an area bounded by Diamond Street, 11th Street, Norris Street, and Marvine Street. And Councilwoman Parker offers on her own behalf an ordinance establishing a no truck parking regulation on both sides of East Godfrey Avenue from Tabor Avenue to Whitaker Avenue. Also referred to me. Councilwoman Gim offers two resolutions entitled a resolution. resolution. Councilman School is here. Let the reflect. I apologize. Uh, uh, Councilman? Councilman? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Screwed up the tech. Councilman. Are we all right now? Modesto? Mm -hmm. Well, Mike, why don't you just Mr. Decker, just proceed. We'll see how this Councilwoman Gim offers two resolutions entitled a resolution honoring and commending Richard M. Gordon IV for being named the 2021 National Principal of the Year by the National Association of Secondary School Principals and for his exemplary leadership as the head of Paul Robeson High School for Human Services. Next week's calendar. And a resolution calling on the Pennsylvania General Assembly to adopt House Bill 526, ending the use of taxpayer funds to pay for cyber charter education when local school districts offer their own full-time cyber school programs. Next week's calendar. Councilman Heenan offers two bills entitled an ordinance of any chapter 19, 1300 of the Philippi Code entitled real estate taxes by clarifying definitions and process regarding qualification for certain tax abatements based on tax delinquency. And an, and an ordinance amending Title IX of the Philadelphia Code to address matters related to commercial leases and provide eviction and financial relief to restaurant businesses that operate on leased premises. I'm for the committee. Councilman Jones offers three bills entitled an ordinance authorizing an encroachment in the nature of a pedestrian staircase to directly access Green Lane Bridge in the vicinity of 1 Leverington Avenue. And an ordinance amending section 14513 of the Philadelphia Code entitled NCO Neighborhood Conservation Overlay District by re revising and clarifying certain provisions and making related changes. And an ordinance amending Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning to revise certain provisions of Chapter 14200 entitled Definitions and Chapter 14500 entitled Overlay Zoning Districts by amending the provisions of the WWO Wissahickon Watershed Overlay. Those three bills will be referred to committee. Councilman Johnson offers one bill entitled An Ordinance Authorizing the Revision of Lines and Grades in a Portion of City Plan Number 46S by striking from the city plan and vacating Penrose Ferry Road from Penrose Avenue to its terminus northeastwardly therefrom 
and reserving and placing on the city plan of right of way for various public utility purposes within the lines of Penrose Ferry Road being stricken and authorizing acceptance of the grant to the city of the said right of way being reserved. That will be referred to committee. Councilwoman Brooks offers one resolution entitled a resolution affirming all Philadelphians first amendment rights to protest and peaceable, peaceful assembly, particularly in response to the upcoming presidential election. No, um, Mr. Decker, I'm sorry, I got this. that was the resolution. That was a resolution, Mr. President. Okay, that will be on next week's calendar. Councilman Dom offers one resolution entitled a resolution honoring and congratulating Department of Licenses and Inspections Commissioner David Perry on his retirement from the city of Philadelphia and recognizing his exceptional leadership and accomplishments over a distinguished career in public service. Councilman Dom, did you want to be recognized? Yes, please, Council President. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's kind of amazing to me. Uh, Commissioner Perry is retiring uh, this month after 39 years of service to the city of Philadelphia. Unbelievable. He was you know, trained as an engineer. He first worked for the city as an engineer in the water department. He then joined Illinois as a building plans examiner, later held many roles as a permit services manager, chief code engineer, head of license issuance and head of the real estate certification unit. And he served as commissioner of the streets department. Today, of course, we know him as the LNI commissioner, and he has created impactful change in that in that department. But in addition to his many accomplishments in safety and technology, Commissioner Perry has also, with all of us as a team, has fought to effectively modernize the building codes, meet international quality standards for accreditation and enforce violations. And by the way, all, all the colleagues on city council uh, co-sponsored, I thank everybody. And I think one of the uh, most amazing parts of Commissioner Perry beyond his personal accomplishments dealing with the commissioner was always a pleasure for me and i believe all my colleagues he was just just a good person he had tremendous drive to get the job done he had an, a, his availability to explain complicated issues that a lot of us didn't understand and we appreciated his, his explaining it to us he's just a good good person and you know we, we all look back on our lives and say what did we accomplish there's something that commissioner perry in 39 years of service to the city we all are proud of what he did and he should be extremely proud. And I can't say enough good things about him. He's just, just amazing. And I know all of us feel the same way and I thank everybody. Thank you, Council President. Thank, thank you, Councilman. Uh, that will be on next week's calendar. Councilman Thomas offers one resolution entitled a resolution honoring and congratulating the Frankfurt High School baseball team on their successful 2019 season and conference 11 to three record in the Philadelphia Public League. Uh, thank you. That will be on next week's calendar. Councilman O offers two resolutions. Entitled a resolution recognizing October 2020 as Filipino American History Month in the city of Philadelphia. Next week's calendar. And a resolution recognizing and honoring the Russian language newspaper, Philadelphia News, on the occasion of its 25th anniversary in print media. Also on next week's calendar. There are no other bills or resolutions being offered by the members today, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. Decker. And our next order of business is reports from committees and the chair recognizes Councilman Johnson for a report from the committee on rules. Thank you, Council President. The committee on rules reports out two bills with a favorable recommendation. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Mr. Decker, would you please read the report? The committee on rules to which is referred bill number 200389 entitled an ordinance continuing the Mayfair Business Improvement District beyond its termination date in an area that generally includes both sides of Frankfurt Avenue from the north side of Harbison Avenue to the south side of Sheffield Street and certain blocks of streets that intersect that portion of Frankfurt Avenue. And for which the Mayfair Business Improvement District Incorporated, the Pennsylvania Nonprofit Corporation, is a neighborhood business improvement district management association for the, bit, for the district. And bill number 200417 entitled an ordinance amending title four of the Philadelphia Code entitled the Building Construction and Occupancy Code and title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning by adding disclosure requirements with respect to certain applications, permits, and notices. Respectfully reports it as considered and amended the same and returns the attached bills to council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you. Chair again recognizes Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the rules of council be suspended so as to permit first reading of this day of bill numbers 200389 and 200417. Second. 
Thank you. It has been moved and properly second that the rules of council be suspended so as to permit reading this day of bills number 200389 and 200417. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, ayes have And these bills will be placed on our first reading calendar today. Chair now recognizes Councilwoman Parker. We'll report from the We'll report from the Committee on Law and Government. Thank you, Mr. President. The Committee on Law and Government reports out two bills with a favorable recommendation. I'm on council now. I'll call you back. Thank you. Mr. Decker, would you please read the report? The Committee on Law and Government, which is deferred bill number 200159, entitled an ordinance amending chapter 9800 of the Philippi Code entitled Landlord and Tenant to clarify and amend applicable procedures pertaining to the Fair Housing Commission and to provide for the adoption of regulations. And bill number 200252 entitled an ordinance amending chapter 91100 of the Philippi Code entitled Fair Practices Ordinance Protections Against Unlawful Discrimination to clarify that unlawful discrimination includes discrimination based on characteristics such as hair texture and hairstyles. Respectfully reports it has considered the same and returns the attached bills to council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Decker. Chair again recognizes Councilwoman Parker. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the rules of council be suspended so as to permit first reading this day of bill numbers 200159 and 200252. Second. Thank you. It has been moved and properly second that the rules of council be suspended so as to permit first reading this day of bills number 200159 and 200252. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Internet's a little slow, Council President. Those opposed. <laughs> those opposed. I have it. These bills will be placed on our first reading calendar today. Uh, the chair now recognizes Councilman Thomas for a report from the Committee on Streets and Services. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Committee on Streets and Services reports out 25 bills uh, with a favorable recommendation. Wow. Yeah, it was, thank, you. It was, thank you to the committee. Good work, young man. Good work. Here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, 25 bills is a lot remotely or in person, either way. Uh, Mr. Decker, would you please read that report? The Committee on Streets and Services, to which is referred Bill Number 200093, entitled "An Ordinance Establishing Parking Regulations in the Vicinity of North Third Street and Fairmont Avenue, Wilder Street and Marlborough Street, George Street and North Second Street, Salmon Street and Columbia Avenue, Montgomery Avenue and Wilder Street, Oriana Street and George Street," and Bill Number 200158, entitled "An Ordinance." authorizing Altera Properties to construct, own, and maintain a proposed exterior building ramp and steps at 1401 through 15 Arch Street. And bill number 200162 entitled an ordinance amending section 12701 of the Philippi Code, entitled designation of bicycle lanes, to authorize a buffered bicycle lane on Spruce Street from 2nd Street to 22nd Street and on Pine Street from Front Street to 18th Street. And bill number 200163, entitled an ordinance establishing no truck parking regulations on Delfield Avenue between North 20th Street and Worcester Street and Ogons Avenue between West Somerville Avenue and Lindley Avenue. And bill number 200179, entitled an ordinance amending section 9213 of the Philippi Code, entitled Farmers Markets, by adding a permissible location on Ogons Avenue. And bill number 200185 entitled an ordinance amending section 12701 of the Philippi Code entitled designation of bicycle lanes to authorize bicycle lanes in the vicinity of Passyunk Avenue from 61st Street to Essington Avenue and Essington Avenue from Passyunk Avenue to Bartram Avenue and making associated changes to parking regulations within the same limits. And bill number 200186 entitled an ordinance amending section 12701 of the Philippi Code entitled designation of bicycle lanes to authorize bicycle lanes in the 3rd Council District in the vicinity of South 49th Street and Pascal Avenue to Grays Avenue, Grays Avenue from 49th Street to Lindbergh Boulevard, and Lindbergh Boulevard from Grays Avenue to Elmwood Avenue, and making associated changes to parking regulations within the same limits. And Bill number 200187 entitled an ordinance establishing a no parking regulation on the east side of North 31st Street between Jefferson Street and West Thompson Street. And Bill number 200 
2-0-9, entitled an ordinance establishing parking regulations in the vicinity of Green Street and North 11th Street, North 13th Street and Mount Vernon Street, Allen Street and Germantown Avenue, Wallace Street and North 12th Street, Lawrence Street and Poplar Street, Brandy, Brandywine Street and North 10th Street, Burke Street and Gerard Avenue. And bill number 200210 entitled an ordinance authorizing Walnut Street Theater Corporation to construct, own, and maintain a proposed building overhang encroachment at 815 through 23 Walnut Street. And bill number 200211 entitled an ordinance establishing no truck parking regulations on 5800 Musgrave Street. And bill number 200259 entitled an ordinance authorizing the construction, installation, ownership, use, and maintenance of an open air sidewalk cafe at 901 through 25 North Delaware Avenue. And bill number 200373 entitled an ordinance authorizing Gojo Incorporated to install, own, and maintain a proposed sidewalk cafe at 4536 through 40 Baltimore Avenue. And bill number 200388 entitled an ordinance authorizing RPG Hamilton LLC, Dara Radner Property Group LLC to construct, own, and maintain both existing and proposed pedestrian scale street lights at 440 North 15th Street. And bill number 200415 entitled an ordinance establishing a no truck parking regulation on both sides of Talbot Street from Torresdale Avenue eastbound to the end of the roadway. And bill number 200422 entitled an ordinance authorizing the Philadelphia Chinatown Development Corporation, also known as PCDC, to own and maintain a pedestrian plaza along the west meridian of 10th Street and Vine Street intersection on the structure carrying traffic above Interstate 676 in Philadelphia. And bill number 200423 entitled an ordinance authorizing Keystone Property Group to construct, own, and maintain a proposed exterior building ramp at 100 South Independence Mall West. And bill number 200481 entitled an ordinance authorizing the Church View Commons Condominium Association to own and maintain street lighting encroachments along the 100 block of Church Street. And bill number 200495 entitled an ordinance regulating the direction of movement of traffic on certain portions of Ludlow Street. And bill number 200496 entitled an ordinance amending section 11104 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Curb Cuts. To define curb cut and add prohibitions on curb cuts in order to facilitate the construction of transit platforms. And bill number 200497 entitled an ordinance amending bill number 200351 entitled an ordinance authorizing the operation of sidewalk cafes during the COVID-19 emergency and just until December 31, 2020 in areas of the city where such activity currently must be otherwise authorized by special ordinance and allowing expanded activity by currently licensed sidewalk cafe operations to extend the date bill number 200351 will remain in effect. And bill number 200498, entitled an ordinance amending bill number 200352, entitled an ordinance amending chapter 11100 of the Philadelphia Code and Title General Provisions to authorize the Streets Department to permit closure of the public right of way to extend the date bill number 200352 will remain in effect. And bill number 200499, entitled an ordinance authorizing Mark Capriati install, own, and maintain a proposed sidewalk cafe at 310 West Master Street. And bill number 200500 entitled an ordinance of removing existing parking meters and regulations, as well as establishing an authorized vehicles only regulation in front of 7306 Castor Avenue and both sides of the 7300 block of Elgin Street. And bill number 200517 entitled an ordinance amending section five of an ordinance bill number 180692 approved October 31, 2018 entitled an ordinance legalizing an existing wood deck and ramp encroachment at 1338 through 1344 Rising Sun Avenue by extending the period of compliance with the terms and conditions stated therein. Respectfully reports it as considered the same and returns the attached bills to council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you, Chair recognizes Councilman Thomas. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the rules of council be suspended so as to permit the first reading this day on the 25 bills that were just read into record by the clerk. Second. Thank you. It has been moved and properly second that the rules of council be suspended so as to permit first reading this day of the 25 bills that were just read into the record by the clerk. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Uh, these bills will be placed on our first reading calendar for today. Uh, Chair now recognizes Councilman Jones for a report from the Committee on Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. President. I have but one bill, but it was a long hearing uh, to report from a committee, uh, a committee on public safety with one, with a favorable recommendation. Thank you. Mr. Decker, would you please read the report? The Committee on Public Safety, to which is referred Bill Number 200538, entitled an ordinance amending Title 10 of the Philadelphia Code, to create a new Chapter 102500 entitled Less Lethal Devices, to regulate the use of less lethal devices in specific situations. Respectfully, reports it is considered the same and returns the attached bill to council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you. The chair again recognizes Councilman Jones. Thank you again, Mr. President. I move that the rules of council be suspended to permit the reading this day of bill number 200538. Second. Thank you. It has been moved and properly second that the rules of council be suspended so that to permit first reading this day of bill number 200538. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, ayes have it, and this bill will be placed in our first reading calendar today. That concludes our reports from the committee. We will now proceed under a special order of business. A motion that council reconsider the vote by which bill number 200094 was passed. This bill was passed by the council at its October 1st, 2020 session and was returned disapproved by the mayor at the session of council on October 15, 2020. Uh, Mr. Decker, will you please read the title of the bill? Bill number 200094, entitled an ordinance amending Title 14 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled Zoning and Planning, to revise certain provisions of Section 14500 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled Overlay Zoning Districts, by modifying the CTR Center City Overlay District, Society Hill area, to create additional standards concerning height, parking, signs, and special reviews, and making related changes. Thank you. At this time, the chair recognizes Councilman Squilla. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the council reconsider bill number 200094, which approved by city council on October 1st, 2020. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Those in favor? Nay. Nay. One. Four. All right. no. Motion carries. Bill number 200094 will be placed at the end of today's calendar. Thank you. Uh, the next order of business is the consideration of the calendar. I note that the bills just reported from committee with suspension of the rules have been deemed to have had a first reading. These bills will be placed in our second reading and final passage calendar at our next session of council. As there are no additional bills on the first reading calendar, the chair recognizes Councilwoman Parker for the purpose of calling up bills and resolutions on the final reading and second passage calendar. Thank you, Mr. President. The following resolutions and bills are being called up from the second reading and final passage calendars today. They are numbers 200564, 200566, and 200392. All other bills and resolutions are being held. Thank you. Before we proceed with the consideration of, of the public comment, we will now take a five minute um, break to allow our technology professionals some time to connect the speakers we have for today's meeting.
chair, we are not live. Ready? Thank you. Okay, now that everyone is connected to the meeting and before considering the resolutions and bills we have before us today, we will consider public comment. It will go as follows. The public comment must concern matters on the second reading and final passes calendar for possible action at a session of council. A speaker on any of these matters must sign up in order to testify. You must call 215-686-3406 by 5 p.m. the day before the session to sign up for public comment. When you call, we will take your name, phone number, the number of the legislative item you are commenting on, and whether you are in support or against the legislation you add to the list. We will telephone each person on the list during the council session and invite them to our remote meeting. Uh, under ideal circumstances, um, we will give each speaker three minutes. So I think today uh, we will have the ability to have three minutes to speak um, because our calendar is not that long and our witness list is not very long. So um, just want to remind you um, that 30 seconds prior to um, the conclusion of your three minutes, uh, there will be a bell and we uh, ask that you adhere to our guidelines and, and start the process of concluding uh, your testimony. So uh, one other note, I just want you all to please be aware that the public meeting is being recorded and because the meeting is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. So by continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Um, I will now ask uh, Mr. Decker to please read the first name on our list. Larry Spector. Uh, good morning and thanks for this opportunity to speak. Uh, I am uh, the president of the Society Hill Civic Association. Uh, I first want to simply say that the uh, uh, overlay bill that's the subject of the override bill, override vote has been generated after years of planning and outreach to the community uh, an extensive consultation with Councilman Squillar Councilman. Uh, and as evidence of that, I want to note that we have submitted to each member of council a copy of a petition that's been signed by over 700 people in our community urging the override of the veto. The main feature of the overlay bill is the 65 foot height limit. Uh, contrary to what some have suggested, it does not apply to a wide area of Society Hill. It applies only to two blocks, the 200 and 300 blocks of Walnut. The 300 block is already built up, so as a practical matter, it's really only the 200 block. So why have a height limit there? The reason is that these blocks are directly across from Independence National Historic Park. There in the 200 block stands the magnificent Merchants Exchange building. It's a national historic landmark. It's buildings like this that have given our city the distinction to be named a World Heritage City. We should not allow tall buildings to dwarf the Merchants Exchange and destroy the scale and character of the area around it. That's why our bill was supported by the Independence National Historic Park and the Preservation Alliance of Greater Philadelphia. Other cities with historic areas have height limits in adjacent areas. Baltimore, Boston, Georgetown, and DC all have height limits that are similar to this one. And we've given members of council a zoning map that shows even our own old city has a height limit as do parts of Chinatown in Philadelphia. Now the height limit I wanna emphasize doesn't mean that you can never have a taller building there. We stand ready to work with any developer who would seek a variance that respects the scale and character of the 200 block of Walnut Street. All this bill does is guard against the developer having the absolute right to build a tall building on that block in disregard of those interests. I wanna address the criticism that the height limit will make it more difficult to achieve affordable housing goals. Go ahead, sir. The basis for this claim is that if luxury high rise condos are not built on the 200 block of Walnut, they'll get built in other neighborhoods and squeeze out potential affordable housing in those areas. But reality matters here. Luxury development locations are not a commodity. There's a familiar saying when it comes to real estate, location, location, location. 
So it's the market, it's location that dictates where high-end units will be situated. Uh, we supported 85 units uh, at a building that was constructed at 500 Walnut, but the developer built it with only 35 units. The fact of the matter is that if we really want to insist on affordable housing uh, in all areas of the city, nothing short of mandating affordable units on site is actually going to do that. So the bottom line is that by not allowing tall luxury buildings in the 200 block of Walnut by right, those luxury buildings are not going to be built in other areas of the city. So respectfully, this line of reasoning that they will be built elsewhere and squeeze out affordable housing that might otherwise go elsewhere just doesn't hold up. Uh, there are a couple other uh, aspects of our bills. Uh, the historic preservation law carve out uh, last year's law created an incentive for building owners and developers to nominate their properties for historic designation by giving them very liberal development rights they otherwise wouldn't have, including allowing CMX3 uses to be built in residential buildings. But in society held all of our old building stock is already historically designated. It's fully protected. There's not a single building in danger of collapse or demolition for lack of a zoning variance. So here, these bills would actually backfire in Society Hill and just end up giving developers more leverage to use in negotiating with nearby residents. Uh, there's a sign aspect of our bills. Uh, we understand that there's thin funding of the commission, historical commission, to review every new sign proposal. But really, uh, we have very few commercial buildings, and we would expect maybe only one or two signs annually. Uh, finally, parking. Uh, we are in a terrible squeeze from visitors to Old City, South Street, Spruce Street, Harbor Park, and so on. Uh, our bill simply proposes that large development projects have three parking spots for every 10 units. This is hardly a radical idea. Uh, all we're asking here is... Yes, I'm finishing right can, now. Is yeah, we, yeah, yeah, actually, the someone with the bell fell asleep, so you're way beyond the three-minute limit. So if you could just kind of, okay. kind of All you. right. Thanks. And uh, then I will simply say that we just ask that we act a little bit more like the world's heritage city, and respectfully, we ask that you override the veto. Thank you. And thank you, sir, for your testimony. We appreciate you. Mr. Decker, next next speaker. Ben Shi. Also commenting on the override for 200094. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. My name is Benjamin Shi, S-H-E. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Fifth Square in opposition of the proposed motion to override um, the veto for the Society Hill overlay. Um, crucially, we think that this overlay is inherently exclusionary. It's exclusionary zoning, it's exclusionary development, um, and crucially, it puts the Society Hill Civic Association at the central position of power to control any development that comes in their neighborhood. Um, we think this is ultimately inequitable as the city is, as the city's neighborhoods um, are work, work, work all in the system. And it is absolutely true that blocking development in one section of the city will have ramifications and downstream effects on other neighborhoods um, outside Society Hill itself. Um, crucially, we also believe that the uh, assertion that the planning process for the neighborhood plan uh, by Society Hill Civic Association and Council Member Square was um, ultimately um, inequitable and did not reach uh, residents, all residents even within the Society Hill uh, neighborhood itself. Um, this is due to the fact that you know this uh, this plan was not was not was not created under the direct authority of the planning commission, but only within the civic association itself, an RCO, a private RCO that requires member dues uh, to be a full member. Uh, of. A full member. Uh, so, so we so 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 um we we assert that uh, this plan um, does not have any basis. Um, should be accepted by state council after such little uh, deliberation and discussion with various parts of the city. Um, we also like to remind council that the city's own housing action plan states that strong market neighborhoods like Society Hill 
should accept even higher density in order to facilitate on-site affordable housing and ensure steady revenue in a housing trust fund, the city's only major source of affordable housing funding. Um, we believe that, um, that that clogging up this process through a variance process uh, through the ZBA is wholly antithetical to the city's own housing goals as stated in the mayor's housing action plan. Um, Secondly, we'd also like to address the historic context of Society Hill as well and remind the council uh, that, the, that the height limits that exist in Old City um, does not extend beyond Market Street down to Society Hill in the first place. And also um, that um, historic context be trying to be defended here is a wholly um, ahistorical invention uh, during the process of urban renewal. Um, and that, um, that multiple preservation groups, including Repoint's PHL, the city's only preservation pres uh, preservation political action committee, is also in opposition to this bill as well. Um, for these reasons and more, we strongly uh, urge council to please uh, over uh, uh, oppose the veto, uh, oppose oppose the veto. Um, sorry, oppose the override uh, to side hill overlay. Thank you. Thank thank you so much for your testimony. Appreciate. The next speaker is Mary Purcell. Also commenting on 200094. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Morning. Yes, we can. On this stage, your name Yes, this is Mary Purcell. I'm also with, um, I'm with Society Hill. Um, I want to thank Councilman Squilla and I want to thank the council members. And I do support the override of the bill. Um, the heart of this bill really is historic preservation. Um, uh, Mr. Xi is uh, misinformed. Um, this, uh, our neighborhood plan commenced in 2016. The planning commission staff was involved from day one. And um, we engaged um, stakeholders all across the neighborhood, including the institutions, um, the residents in the high rises, townhouses, um, the schools, the houses of worship, all stakeholders were involved. We had a public process, we had public meetings. Our neighborhood plan was posted out on our website. Um, we had individual stakeholder meetings as well as group community meetings. Um, subsequently, our, after our master plan was accepted by the Planning Commission in July of 2018, what, what actually happened was we made additional compromises. So the process that is referenced that has happened over the last two years is us saying, yes, okay, we'll take this away. Um, the Planning Commission staff and then the Planning Commission leadership continued to meet with us and they asked us to scale back our plan and we did. And so um, our, the bills that we have come for today, including the overlay, it's the result of years of work, extensive community input, extensive input from the Planning Commission staff and extensive compromises made by the neighborhood. Um, you've, you've seen the petitions, you've seen our petition. I won't go into all of the detail, but I will underscore what Larry Spector said, the 65 foot height limit is on just two blocks. It's a fraction of the size of the height limit that exists in, in Old City. Um, and um, it's, it is to protect historic preservation. I have never heard anyone in any of our community meetings say that we are opposed to affordable housing. We embrace it, bring it. I think you, um, council member uh, Quinona Sanchez has suggested at one point it ought to be mandated and development, I say do it. Um, it's not a part of what we're trying to do here. Um, other neighborhoods have overlays. Society Hill is not the first neighborhood to have an overlay to um, respect the particular unique characteristics of this neighborhood. So in closing, I would just say um, this bill and, and this neighborhood really has been misrepresented. And I hope you understand that it has been indeed an inclusive process with many compromises, I support this bill and I ask you please to override this veto. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. There are no other speakers in the public comment list, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. Decker. That concludes our public comment for the day. Uh, we will now consider the bills and resolutions on the second reading and final passes calendar. So with that, Mr. Decker, will you please read the title of resolution number 200564. Uh, a resolution honoring and recognizing the life and legacy of Alexander R. Hornsey for his heroic service and impact on Philadelphia and the United States of America. 
Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilman Heenan. Thank you, Council President. Motion to approve the resolution. Second. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, ayes have it, and that resolution is adopted. Mr. Decker, please read the title of resolution number 200566. A resolution honoring and congratulating the Central High School softball team on their successful 2019 season and overall 10 to 1 record in the Philadelphia Public League. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilman Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. I move for the adoption of the resolution. Second. Thank you. This move on probably second. The resolution be adopted. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. And that resolution is adopted. Mr. Decker, please read the title of bill number 200392. An ordinance amending section 10403 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Prohibited Conduct by prohibiting the use of consumer fireworks and providing certain penalties. Thank you. This bill having been read on two different days. The question now is shall the bill pass finally? Mr. Decker, call the roll. Councilwoman Bass. Councilwoman Bass. Oh, okay. We got it. Hi. Right. <laughs> we got it. Councilwoman Brooks. Aye. Councilman Dom. Aye. Councilwoman Gautier. Aye. Sorry. Aye. Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Councilwoman Gim. Aye. Councilman Heenan. Aye. Councilman Johnson. Aye. Councilman Jones. Aye. Councilman O. And do we have a list of bills? Aye. Councilman O'Neill. Aye. Councilwoman Parker. Aye. Councilwoman Kiruna Sanchez. Aye. Councilman Squilla. Aye. Councilman Thomas. Aye. Council President Clark. Aye, the ayes are 17, the nays are zero. Majority of all members haven't voted in the affirmative the bill passes. Mr. Decker, do you have any additional resolutions? There are no resolutions on the final passage calendar, Mr. President. All right, let me break that record after all. Um, we will now proceed the consideration of bill number 200009, oh, I'm sorry, 94, which was passed by council at its October 1st, 2020 session and was returned disapproved by the mayor at the session of the council on October 15th. Um, right. Mr. Decker, just read the title and we'll recognize Councilman Squilla after the title is read. Bill number 200094, entitled an ordinance of any title 14 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Zoning and Planning to revise certain provisions of Section 14500 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled Overlay Zoning Districts, by modifying the CTR Center City Overlay District Society Hill area to create additional standards concerning height, parking, signs, and special reviews, and making related changes. Thank you, Mr. Decker. Chair recognizes Councilman Squilla. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I appreciate the time to uh, offer my words. I'm not going to rehash everything that uh, the public comment has said and go over the full details of the bill, but just, just for a point of reference, uh, the mayor had appointed me to the historic task force um, as we were looking through how to go and, and look at incentives and how we could get more historic preservation and restoring historic nature for our first world heritage city, the city of Philadelphia and the country, and how important that was. And, and during that process, I learned a lot. And I learned about other cities and I learned about other municipalities and how they and what they did to help protect some of the areas that were real important to that city of Philadelphia. And during this process, and, and you heard somebody say that planning wasn't involved in the process. This has been uh, almost a four year process, two and a half years that I've been involved with, um, of back and forth and compromises back and forth. And um, 
you know, we learned that if we want to really be a great city, you know, we are a city of neighborhoods. We are a city where people should have a say and input in what goes on in their communities. All of a sudden, the narrative has been changed is that it doesn't matter what people think who live in communities and live in different neighborhoods, that we know better than everybody else. And, and we should just do what we want because uh, those people shouldn't have a voice. And I think even during this process, there were conversations that we had with the community that they weren't happy with. Um, you know, the overlay was a lot bigger when it first started. And, and we went through, you know, grinding, ruling conversations and, you know, narrowed the uh, scope of it down. And we went into make sure it was only a two block area to protect what we believe was the most historic, important historic facts and um, properties in, in Society Hill, the Mercantile Exchange. So, you know, some of the things that you heard of what this bill is going to do is, is kind of, I think, an overreach. And I think what some of the folks said, well, this is going to happen and you're going to have overlays in other areas. We've had overlays in other areas throughout the city of Philadelphia for a long time. Uh, and also what an overlay does, and I have them right in, in, in Old City and, and several other neighborhoods, uh, Northern Liberties, Northern Chinatown, the River Wards, throughout my district. And what it does is it doesn't stop development. It, it requires a variance to build above whatever the, those restrictions are. That enables the community to have a voice in that development and to be a part of the process. And to say that that shouldn't be allowed or shouldn't be done because um, uh, the people shouldn't have a say, we should be able just to just develop what we want. We saw what happened in, in Society Hill. And when you're talking about a real tall building, you know, and you want to add density and affordability, but yet you only have 35 units, and th those 35 units are millions of dollars, it doesn't add up to what the arguments are. So what I'm going to ask is, you know, the city is a city of neighborhoods. We respect them. They should have a voice in the process. And all this uh, overlay does is allow uh, the side in labors for the two block area of the height limit to have a voice in development and meet with the developers as they move forward to develop. Uh, we had development in Old City over 65 feet. Uh, even with the 65 foot height limit, able to negotiate with the community and with the council and to go in and build something that was 180 feet tall and it fit within the scope of the development, it fit within the historic preservation of the area. And so these things can happen even with an overlay. Um, so I, I'm going to uh, ask my colleagues to please support me in the override of this veto. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, with that being said, this bill has not been read. Council President, Council President, um, I just have a Chair recognizes Councilman Green. Uh, point of information for Councilman Squilla. Um, there was a back and forth, and you alluded to some of this regarding the involvement of the Planning Commission. Um, and there's been some perspective on whether the Planning Commission was driving this process or not in the community engagement. Um, can you give a little more context to that? Um, was this part of the um, Planning Commission 2035 process? Um, was the Planning Commission driving this or was this a joint activity between Society Hill Civic Association and the Planning Commission? And then you said you talked about compromise. Um, was it a, a larger um, footprint and then that compromise was based on the give and take between the Planning Commission and the Civic Association, but how did you get to a smaller footprint? So the, this process was a, a, a joint effort between planning, and I want to thank, and I should have did that during my speech, I want to thank Ian Litwin, who has been involved for the last four years on this. Ian Litwin was one of the head planners who had worked with Society Hill as a joint effort. Was that all those meetings with that uh, the community uh, outreach events um, hammered out not only the overlay that we did that was supportive, but we also did a remapping of the area, uh, which means it changed zoning zoning classifications throughout the district. And you know we went through back and forth with Ian and uh, the planning staff to go over what would work, what didn't work. And and even though at the end of the day, um, a lot of the zoning classifications um, were changed back to what Society Hill had supported but then went back to what planning supported this process took a lot of time so the, the, it was actually done together which way it should be uh with planning and and the community involved and back and forth conversations the overlay was a lot bigger it included all the way down to front street which is a, a site for a high-rise development um it include one dock street we actually curtailed it back just to be within their boundaries, which are historic boundaries, a second to fourth street. And we only made it one block instead of going south of Walnut, it only included Walnut Street. And that development that's going to happen there at one dock street is going to be a high rise and it's not going to be affordable. 
and um, and Society Hill wasn't okay with that compromise, but to move this forward in the scope of working together and working with planning, was able to um, give up that one block, knowing that it would still increase development in that area, but knew overall it would protect the historic preservation of the Mercantile Exchange and, and the park services, uh, which was just north of Walnut Street. So this one follow-up question. So this piece of legislation, this overlay district, came out of the remapping work that the planning commission was doing. So as as district council members know, the planning commission is doing remapping throughout the entire city of Philadelphia as a follow-up to the new zoning code as part of their 2035 plan. So this was an outgrowth of that work of the remapping for that area. That That's correct. And also we've We've done remapping in several areas several times uh, throughout my district because it's again just like the zoning um, the zoning code it's a living breathing document and sometimes there's unintended consequences when we remap an area like even though we remap society hill there are going to be coming some issues where planning might come to us and say you know what this zoning doesn't match let's go back to the community and let's try to change this one block of uh, of zoning a, a zoning criteria and we will still go back and remap an area periodically. But this was done as a, a matter of the whole community, remapping of the whole community. And um, the overlay was something that was added into that uh, by at request of the community group and worked through with planning. And uh, so it, it wasn't part of the original remapping process, but it got added as conversations were going during that four year process. Uh, thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council Member Squilla. Thank you. Thank you, Council. There are no other points of order. I'm going to call for a vote. This bill having been read on two different days, duly approved by City Council on October 1st, 2020, and was returned to Council by the Mayor as disapproved at the session of Council on October 15, 2020. The question now is shall the bill number 200094 pass, notwithstanding the Mayor's disapproval? Just for the record, let's note that a vote of aye is a vote to override the mayor's veto, and a vote of nay is a vote to sustain the mayor's veto. Mr. Decker, will you please call the roll? Councilwoman Bass? Aye. Councilwoman Brooks? Nay. Councilman Dom? Aye. Councilwoman Gauthier? Nay. Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Councilwoman Gim. Nay. Councilman Heenan. Councilman Heenan. Aye. Councilman Johnson. Aye. Councilman Jones. Aye. Councilman O. Aye. Councilman O'Neill. Aye. Councilwoman Parker. Aye. Councilwoman Canone Sanchez. Aye. Councilman Squilla. Aye. Councilman Thomas. Nay. Council President Clark. Aye. Ayes are 13, nays are four. Majority of Two thirds majority of all members on council having voted in affirmative, the mayor's veto is overridden. That completes our calendar for today. And there is, prior to recognizing with speeches and members regarding the speeches, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized in order to comply with the Sunshine Act. Uh, the chat feature must only be used for that purpose. That said, are there any speeches on behalf of the minority? Chair recognizes Councilwoman Brooks. Thank you so much, Council President. 
Okay. I wanted to um, just address some concerns that have been, you know, very def making it difficult for me to sleep at night. One of them is yesterday the state's house failed to advance legislation to fix the Pennsylvania's rent relief program, which expires November 4th. This means a huge amount of federal funds will be wasted and landlords and renters across Philadelphia will go months without life-saving aid. Here in the poorest, biggest city in the country, the option that Philadelphia families have for survival are becoming fewer and fewer. Similarly, here in Philadelphia, the court's local eviction moratorium will also expire early November, leaving only the CDC's eviction moratorium in place, which is solely inaccurate. inaccurate. The CDC moratorium does not prohibit late fees or interest, nor does it create rent repayment plans, meaning renters who cannot pay, cannot pay will amass an insurmountable debt and will face eviction when the moratorium ends. This CDC moratorium excludes thousands of renters and will inevitably lead in a spike in evictions. Further complicating the situation, Hello. families faced in this federal government inaction. The second stimulus bill has been indefinitely delayed. Poor leadership and decision making has led to the spike, a deadly spike in COVID-19 cases that we have seen increasing since the spring. As winter approaches, there's little hope that a vaccine will be approved anytime soon. It is clear that in the, in the, in the absence, absence of action from the state and federal levels, the responsibility falls to local legislators, to us, to protect our constituents and legislate through this crisis. Lives are depending on it. And I fear that we are not meeting the urgency of this moment. Just one year ago, I was on the other side of this building, City Hall, as an activist, a concerned community member, a spectator to city council sessions. And I wish I could do more to help my community. Now that I'm inside and better understand the interworkings of council, I worry that the pressures we face from corporate lobbyists, from issue-based groups, from the mayor's administration, from developers, from our political parties, from corporations, and yes, even from each other, are stopping us from prioritizing the needs of the most vulnerable constituents, the working class, the poor, black, and brown constituents that make up the majority of our city. Our community members are not just suffering. Their situation is rapidly getting worse before our eyes. There is no one coming to save them. It is our responsibility to do everything in our power to act, to protect our most vulnerable community members with action, not just words and not just symbolic gestures. To be clear, I fear that as a body, we are not doing enough for the next generation of Philadelphians who will come into adulthood in a city that's racked with poverty, homelessness, and equity if we do not act. I fear that years from now, we will ask ourselves, why did we not do more during the greatest public health and economic crisis in our lifetimes? So today, I'm calling on the federal government, the state legislator, on the mayor's administration, on this council body, myself included, to do more and to do better. We are elected into office to find solutions to these seamlessly insurmountable problems. Our hands are not tied. We have the power indeed the responsibility to do everything that we can to support our constituents in this time of need. Thank you so much, Council President. Thank you, Councilwoman. That concludes, I believe, speaking on behalf of the minority. On behalf of the majority, Chair recognizes Councilwoman Parker. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, I just quickly wanted to take this opportunity to say special 
a special thank you to council member Adam for taking the lead in introducing the commissioner Perry uh, resolution. Um, I just want to note for the record, uh, Mr. President, that because I started working in this body when I was 17 and a community organizer, and I was a volunteer um, from the age of 17 through 21, uh, at 22, I became a full-time member of the staff of Councilwoman uh, Marion Tasco and bounced between her office and Gussie's office doing work, I learned to respect and admire the people who actually get the work done in local government. I'm talking about the staff who worked for the elected officials. Yeah, people push the button for us, but I'm talking about just like our teams, our staffs, our tech staff. And, this, and another thing that I learned, Mr. President, and, I, and I'm so happy that because I worked here, I learned to respect it. I learned to respect the commissioners here and, and their staffs. And, and, and more importantly, I, I watch, Mr. President, those who come out off of their seats on high when cameras are there and those who behind the scenes do the hard work and will come to the community meeting even if it's not a high profile issue but like when i and long chris and Longdale, you all may remember when that fentanyl was spilled and it was it was found in one of our houses commissioner perry came out to that meeting and listen people were angry they were scared but he came out with his team so commission if you are listening, I just want to say a special thank you for always going above and beyond the call of duty. We appreciate you. I've watched you. I don't care who was on that second floor. You handled your work the same way and you were responsive and I appreciate that. The final thing I want to say to you uh, colleagues um, is that uh, I want to just quickly share some stats. 203. The total number of Philadelphians employed as cleaning ambassadors and ambassador supervisors to clean commercial quarters in neighborhoods throughout our city. 91 new cleaning ambassador positions. 112 cleaners who are now earning a living wage of at least $15 per hour and receiving professional development training and access to the resources they need to maintain employment and grow professionally. 85, and this is the one I'm probably the most giddy about, 85 commercial quarters are being cleaned between three and seven days a week across the city, which means we nearly doubled the number of commercial quarters in the previous program. 32 is the number of zip codes across the city that will see and feel the impact. Council Member Johnson and Squill, I want you to know that Passionk Avenue and the South Philly represented strong yesterday. 39 is the number of community-based organizations contracting with our Commerce Department to clean our neighborhood commercial quarters in five. Five is the number of minority-owned and operated commercial cleaning companies that are subcontracting with our community-based organizations, cleaning nearly one-third of the 85 quarters. On today, I needed to say thank you to my colleagues in the City Council of Philadelphia. The stats that I just read to you, they are not my accomplishment. They are our accomplishment. We did this together to make sure that every neighborhood in the city could benefit from the cleaning and we would do our best to connect people with access to opportunity so that they can get on a path towards building um, self-sufficiency. Let me thank Mayor Kenny, Streets Commissioner Carlton Williams, their entire team, Stephanie Michelle, Executive Director of North 5th Street Revitalization Project, Mike Crawford, the owner of Holla Sporting Goods and Athletics, Council President Clark, the only thing we got to work on Crawford with is he's with the Aztecs and he needs to come up town and work with the Blue and White Oak Lane Wildcats. Uh, Leroy Towns, the cleaning ambassador from ACAM Management uh, Company. In addition to that, Sylvie Gallant Howard, our acting director in commerce, Karen Fegley, Yvonne, Dennis Murphy, James Anaforio, Taryn Detz, Robert Somerville, Maxine Ferguson, and Nagari Porcena Menias. Uh, Streets Commissioner, a uh, deputy, uh, Keith Warren, Farouk Scott, 
Barbara White, Crystal Sh Jacobs Shipman, Commerce Workforce Division, Zakia Ali, Gianna Grossman, Esther Adeyeme, Katie Wolfgang, uh, AJ Adams, now with PIDC, Ann Nevins, PIDC, Tiffany Kennedy, Adriana Buck, Eileen Barak, Thomas Queenan, Nicole Hennessy, uh, Beth McConnell uh, at PACDC. I'll take you to rumble with me any day. My staff, um, uh, Rachel, Kiasha, Heather, Hillary, John, Michelle, Carla, Gabby, Tasha, William, and Solomon um, who are with us. Today, we are going to continue working on ridding our city of that Philadelphia moniker. And uh, I, I want to say to each and every one uh, of my colleagues, poverty is here. Home ownership is decreasing and rental renters are rising. Even though no matter how large the problems were we had in our city, we have always had a higher amount of home ownership in our city, particularly in the minority community. And we're seeing that amount just dwindle. You know what that means? Access to equity and opportunity. That means self-sufficiency. People who built equity in houses. Guess what? We need to put people on a path to self-sufficiency, listen to the needs of what our people are telling us they need, like very simple stuff like a cleaner neighborhood. And we did that, colleagues. So I want you to remember when it comes time for people to talk about what have we done, I'm not telling you it's the be all end all, but I want you to patch the same day, same work. Um, uh, movement that we just had from Council President Clark. I want you to patch that along with PHL TCB. I want you to patch that with the work we're doing that Councilman Jones uh, has talked about often, the handyman concept that we're that we're working through, and we're moving it. And there's no one celebrity. There's no one who knows more. There's no one who's committed to solving the problems. We did this together, and I want to say a special thank you uh, to each of you. Thank you, Mr. President and colleagues. I know it took me a minute. I had to read those names, but you know, you, you got to respect the people who do the work, right? And not just not just those of us, but these are the people behind the scenes. N reporters don't write about them in the newspaper. I wore their behinds out, texting, emailing, calling. When is it going to get done? So I need to give credit where credit uh, is due. And I told them yesterday that all 17 members of city council who unanimously voted for that $10 million transfer ordinance, that you all were the ones who did it. And I'm honored to work with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Very impressive press conference yesterday. It was, it was really exciting to see those individuals out there uh, that were given that opportunity. Uh, this by for the record, Councilwoman, um, um, you referenced yesterday and today um, the Aztecs. I just want to let you know that the 5th Council District also has the Blackhawks. There's also a Super Bowl winning team. So we have two Super Bowl winning teams in the 5th Council Medic District. Just for the record. Uh, thank you so much, Councilwoman. Next, I'd like to recognize Councilwoman Kim. Thank you very much, Council President. Um, first of all, I just want to give a sincere level of gratitude and thanks to all of my colleagues on City Council for the heroic work that people have been doing uh, throughout this pandemic. I especially want to thank, if I could, members of the Public Safety Committee in particular for all the work that they have done um, in the past three weeks to try and bring some sense of reconciliation, of truth telling and of accountability and uh, each and every one of the members on that committee just bringing a tremendous amount of compassion and a listening ear as we heard between two different hearings, somewhere between six to seven hours of testimony about the events that transpired between May and June. We heard from dozens of residents. We heard from our city agencies. We heard from national uh, leaders in this field. Um, and more important, we, we listen to our communities and um, we are you know we will be continuing this work um, and we will be continuing to move forward on accountability thank you to everybody for the work that you did and for your support of the uh, the ban on less lethal munitions which turn out to be quite lethal and damaging to a lot of people's lives um, 
finally, I just want to speak very briefly with our council body a little bit about what Councilwoman uh, Brooks had talked about and the challenging conversation that honestly we are faced around evictions here in our city. As we all know, on November 8th, 2,000 households, anywhere from 3,000 to 8,000 Philadelphians are at imminent threat of being locked out from their homes. The eviction moratoriums have expired. Um, the CDC moratorium is complicated and has been difficult to enact. And so before us lies the challenge. Do we believe that these evictions should go forward simply based on when Philadelphians faced hard times? Philadelphians faced hard times, poverty. They struggled to pay the rent pre-COVID. We all know this. A blanket moratorium on an eviction, which is within our power, does not turn our back on them right now as COVID is on the rise. Last spring, our council took bold action to en enact an eviction moratorium through August 31st as the city faced the height of the COVID pandemic. It was a public health bill, plain and simple. It did not try to draw lines between who deserved to be evicted, who did not. We made a conscious decision last spring that we could not afford to limit who was protected because it dismissed the reality of poverty, of biases and obstacles that exist with our courts, challenges with education and information sharing with landlords and tenants, and because it undermined the public health goal of the bill. This was a moratorium that wasn't just, uh, you know, passed unanimously by our body into local law. It put Philadelphia as a statewide and national leader as our governors and as our cities and states across the country picked up the call. And now caseloads for COVID are hitting another high. Our state and federal government have not stepped up to the plate. And so this burden falls on our shoulders once again. Yesterday, Housing Committee members heard from diverse and moving testifiers in support of an eviction moratorium. Scientists, researchers, tenants, property owners, organizers, legal advocates, and our administration. They prove all the time that there is more to hear, more to understand, and more to figure out amongst us. They talked about excess COVID spread, infections, illnesses, and even death rates that are directly correlated to evictions. And there was a discussion about whether there are unexpected consequences about reinstating a moratorium. This was always going to be a hard conversation, but I don't think that there are unexpected or unintended consequences. We actually know what the gaps are. We have 2000 households who fall outside of traditional COVID protections that are established by an arbitrary date. We need to get them the resources. Uh, we need to get them and their landlords the resources that they need to weather this. We know that our courts have largely not been equal partners with us in informing tenants of their rights or putting up um, guardrails to ensure that rights can be enforced. Reforms need to happen there. We need to ensure and promise that no landlord, especially landlords, small landlords, will be foreclosed upon. And indeed, I think this has been assured through our courts and there are things that we can do here legislatively. We do need to spend money. No one is here asking landlords to absorb this all on their own. But the actual unintended consequences could occur starting November 8th if we let the floodgates go in the middle of this pandemic. Dr. Ayla Stanford from the Black Doctors Consortium said it very quick, clearly. We are not prepared as a city. There are children who are out of school, women, elderly, the disabled, many others who are deeply vulnerable, not just to eviction, but to health and housing disparities that land them in the situation that they were facing in the first place. And like council member Brooks has said, and I know we all ask ourselves when we are through with this or horror, what can we as a council be able to say? And like all of you, I don't sleep well at night at all. I stay up all the time scrolling through, um, thinking about what we're going to say to people uh, who called us desperate for help. Can we say we did what was just, what was right, what science taught us, what the law told us was in our power, and what was safe during the most unprecedented public health emergency in our lifetime? And I've been proud to be part of a city council that understands the importance of home. None of us is home until all of us is home. We want to focus on getting the resources uh, to the people who need them, 
rather than ask questions about who does and does not deserve to be at home. And I will be joining Council Member Brooks and all of the members on Council, continuing the call to our federal government, to our state officials, and to our Council body to prioritize this issue. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilwoman. Chair recognizes Councilman Dow. Thank you, Council President, and uh, I just have a few comments I wanted to make regarding some ongoing efforts that are being made to feed our most vulnerable communities in Philadelphia and to ask my colleagues and the people listening today to help us sustain these efforts. For a few weeks now, my office has been working with Rob Wasserman, the owner of Rouge Restaurant, and Marcello Giordano from Giordano Groceries to raise money for the We Are Philly campaign. The website's actually wearephilly.net. This campaign was set up to create a fun way for people to come together and fund fresh food boxes for communities. The We Are Philly campaign has created a t-shirt for purchase that helps pay for the cost of the food that's packaged and delivered to the various locations all over the city. I think it's important that we continue to talk about the food insecurities in our communities and not lose sight of people's basic needs. Through this campaign, we've been able to deliver total 7,000 boxes, weekly around 500 boxes of fresh food, including milk, eggs, vegetables, every week to families all over the city. We have partnered with neighborhood groups like Campaign for Working Families North in North Philadelphia, Mighty Riders in West Philadelphia, and Caring for Friends in the Northeast to help bring some relief to people who need it right now the most. I really wanna thank Rob Wasserman and Marcello Giordano for spearheading this initiative. They've been doing a phenomenal job throughout this pandemic to raise money to get food into the hands of those who have this felt this food insecurity. And it's devastating when you see people and you hand out the boxes and for people getting this food, it's just like a lifeline. It's really sad. But anyway, these are two business leaders, though, in our city who are getting crushed on the hospitality side, but are humbly helping everyone through this pandemic. So I ask all my colleagues and the public, if you're interested, go to that website, wearephilly.net purchase a t-shirt, help support the efforts, and it really, it really benefits our communities. And on a side note, I just wanna say, it's nice to see many people have noticed them wearing the t-shirts. I think they've sold 9,000 t-shirts so far. And it's nice to see that we are Philly t-shirts all over the city. So thanks for anything you can do to help this program continue. I appreciate everyone's support. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, next, we have Councilwoman Sanchez. Thank you, Council President, and my apologies. I know you wanted a short council session, uh, but you're not going to get one. <laughs> We've already lost the record. We're, we're way past that last year. Um, I want to thank Councilman Dom and, and join the choir with Parker and others around recognizing Commissioner Perry. As many of you know, I chaired the Committee on Licenses and Inspections for 12 years and many times put myself in hard, harm's way between balancing public safety and monopolies of the city of Philadelphia but throughout all of that, throughout the crisis after the, the um, tragedy um, on Market Street, uh, Commissioner Perry would, provided leadership, guidance, clearance, and through the LNI Oversight Board, made tremendous uh, strides in professionalizing the Department of License and Inspection. So I want to join the choir and really thank him. Over time, I considered him a friend. You know, he responded to our emails and our texts at whatever time we sent them, and, and I appreciate um, how much I learned um, from him. I also want to thank Council Member Parker for her work on the commercial carters, many which are in my district, um, and the job Jobs provided and the economic value of the work that is being done is tremendous and, and I want to thank her and her work in that. Uh, this week I was invited, you know, kind of one of those last minute um, situations to a public action and, you know, as a former community organizer, um, I'm a little rusty with the new tactics that are used um, uh, recently around community organizing. So I, I was uh, sent uh, a text and an email about coming to a public action around Save Gloria on 12th Street. And I didn't go, and I didn't go because one, I was invited at the last minute as a way of people checking off the box and saying they invited me. But I didn't go because I didn't have an opportunity to talk to Council Member Squilla, whose district um, encompasses the mural. Gloria Casares was just not a tremendous LGBTQ leader or a, a fabulous Latina. She was my personal friend. And so when people call me out about what's where's where is the Latin ex councilwoman on this? I take it a little personal. Um, and then I said, you know, if Gloria was here, what would Gloria do? Right. And so it reminded me that she 
also was a community organizer. And she taught me many things about having principles when, or when you're organizing folks, when you call people out and hold them accountable. Um, and if Gloria had been here at this particular time, Gloria would be at the table as Councilman Squilla is trying to negotiate, how do you maintain the memorial, not the wall? You know, how do you really preserve the intent and the spirit of that fabulous mural um, done by my good friend, uh, Michelle Ortiz? And so I want to thank Councilman Squilla. I know that he normally um, sits in the background and just gets the work done. I want to thank him because he's working with a developer who who's using mixed income bonus and, and providing millions of dollars to the housing trust fund, who's using the art uh, 1% um, to provide money um, and is willing to reinvest that money in a new memorial for Gloria. So in the spirit of Gloria, if Gloria was here, her community organizing and her leadership, I, I was reminded uh, last evening um, the values and the important work that, that needs to be done. Um, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, watching and hearing President uh, Obama who made community organizing popular um, and him acknowledging that being elected as the first African-American president was not going to resolve the issues of race in this country. And that it is, as a councilman, our council member Isaiah Thomas dialogued with him, it is about one election at a time, one issue at a time, one day at a time. And sometimes we don't get it all. One of the biggest frustrations when I was a freshman here on council was, and many of you know, cause I called you out and I'm very opinionated, which is why when I, somebody challenges me about my opinions, like I have a whole lot of opinions and an opinion about everything, but I don't need to be in everything. I do need to make sure that I'm holding true to the people that I represent, all of the people that I represent, particularly the ones that I disagree with. Um, and in the spirit of Gloria, my personal friend, uh, I, I am ready to work with Councilman Squilla and the activists to, to make sure that her memorial um, and the intent of the memorial to her honor um, continues in, in the city somewhere. Um, but I also want to uh, uh, take take a note and say that, you know, we don't get everything we want in council, and that's very frustrating. And we can't do everything for everyone. All of you know how much Councilman School and I are fighting uh, with Kensington and all of the challenges. But every single day, when I have those sleepless nights, I wake up the next morning with a renewed sense of urgency and commitment that today I'm going to make things a little better, a little better. And some days I make it a lot better. And some days I, I don't do as well and I'm frustrated. Um, but I take this job ex extremely serious. And I appreciate my colleagues and all the work that they're doing and continuing to challenge us to do the best job that, that, that we can. So I'm proud to be a member of this body. We have made really hard decisions in the 13 years I've been here. And I'm prepared every single day to make very hard decisions. Um, and I look forward to those challenges every single day. And I am prepared to fight for money and resources so that we can take care of the citizens of Philadelphia. So thank you uh, to all my colleagues for all their hard work. Um, and we'll live to see another day. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilwoman. Chair recognizes Councilman Thomas. Thank you, Council President. I will try to be a little brief. Um, uh, it's a little difficult. I know we have some important issues that we're talking about. I um, agree with my colleague, and big sister, Council Member Sanchez. It's um, not uh, easy decisions that we have to make on a consistent basis. But I think for me, what's important and what I have um, learned to love about working on this particular team is that um, I don't question my colleagues' intentions. We might not agree on um, how we get to the finish line, but I do believe that we're all trying to get to the same end goal and the same finish line. And so I think it's important, you know, to recognize that while we might have different ideas and different opinions on how we do it, I don't know um, anybody on this body who doesn't want to improve the quality of life of Philadelphians. I'm um, in the spirit of trying to remain positive. Um, I want to also just highlight the champion of the week this week. Um, I'm an alumni of Frankfurt High School, so, you know, had to give Frankfurt High School a little shout out and congratulations to their baseball team. Um, these champions of the week might seem small, like small resolutions, but to the coaches and young people that are recognized, especially at a time when they can't convene, 
celebrate these accomplishments with one another. Um, they are grateful. They're grateful to this body um, for recognizing them and the great work they're, they're doing um, outside of um, the, 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 the long work we do to try to find a revenue to make sure that they can have quality experiences. Um, just also to piggyback on another one of my big sisters, Council Member Parker, uh, she talked a lot about the things that we've accomplished. And one of those things is also the Disadvantaged Communities Task Force. And um, yesterday, like Council Member Sanchez said, I had an opportunity to engage our first black president who talked about uh, what it meant to be the first black president in the city of Philadelphia. And he did that just 10 minutes away from where we launched our resource hubs. And I appreciate um, just the location, if anything, coming into the heart of North Philadelphia, where we know we have issues of poverty, gun violence, and employment, um, and, and, and having this important conversation. So today, um, uh, 4 o'clock, uh, we will still be outdoors um, having our resource hubs for teenagers here in the city of Philadelphia. No matter how you feel about any vote or any decision that was made today, I'm pretty sure you know a teenager who can use a job or a positive activity, a mentor, or some type of academic support. So uh, I appreciate my colleagues for uh, the support as it relates to the Disadvantaged Communities Task Force and the resource hubs for our children. I want to thank Council Member Kendra Brooks for uh, facilitating our call this week. And of course, I have to thank uh, my millennial twin, uh, Council Member Kev Catherine Gilmore Richardson, who is um, the co-chair and uh, have been uh, with uh, me every step of the way throughout this, um, I guess you could say, fatiguing journey. We've listened to hundreds of Philadelphians give us nothing but heartbreaking stories. And so when you talk about how difficult it is to sleep at night, you know, imagine just, you know, someone telling you about uh, the death of their husband and going out of business in a short period of time and just having to tell them, you know, anything we can do to help, we're here because um, we need that federal support that uh, Council Member Gim and Council Member Brooks talked about earlier today. So all this stuff coincides. I know I said I wouldn't be that long. Council President is a little difficult this morning, but I do want to say thank you and thank you to my colleagues for all the great work that uh, folks are doing and the continued effort to challenge ourselves to do even better than what's happening right now. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman, and keep up that good work. Uh, Really appreciate you. I'm sorry, Council President, before they text me, resource.hubs at phila.gov. That is how you sign up for the resource hubs. Resource.hubs at phila.gov. Thank you, Council President. Sorry Thank about that. Thank you. We'll, we'll promote it and we'll continue to make sure that we get it out on our social media platform. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Chair, recognize Councilwoman Dr. Yeah. Thank you, Council President. Um, good morning, everyone. I too want to discuss the hearing that Council's Housing Committee held yesterday and that I presided over as chair. The purpose of this hearing was to consider proposed amendments to the Emergency Housing Protection Act. This legislation essentially protects renters from eviction during this pandemic and allows landlords to get paid. The EHPA was introduced by Council Members Brooks, Gim, and myself and was signed into law by Mayor Kenney on July 1st. The amendments we introduced would extend the eviction moratorium in Philadelphia until the end of the year, extend the ban on late fees, and extend the timeline for rent uh, repayment plans. We heard four hours of gripping testimony yesterday, not just from struggling renters who bravely shared their stories, not just from small landlords who are supportive of the legislation, not just from advocates who are passionate about housing justice, but from experts legal experts, medical doctors, epidemiologists um, who told us about the real big picture consequences of what eviction means in this time. It means increased spread of COVID-19 citywide. It means unnecessary deaths from this virus. It means a strain on our city resources, which are already overburdened and in fragile condition due to the recession. After much discussion yesterday, the committee did not ultimately vote on the amendments. The stakes are unfathomably high in this moment. The action that we take or don't take in the next couple of weeks with regard to these, bill, these bills has real immediate repercussions for thousands of people's lives. And these people are more likely to be Black, more likely to be experiencing poverty, and more likely to suffer permanent setbacks as a result of losing their homes. Black single moms are at the highest risk of eviction. This was the case before the pandemic began, and it remains true now. If we don't act, they are at risk of losing their homes, which means that children will also become homeless. 
And since home is now school, that means they will suffer academically as well. Over 20% of our elderly residents live in poverty. The mere threat of an eviction, especially for someone in frail mental or physical health, can be disastrous. Elderly folks are also less likely to be able to fend for themselves in the eviction process. And on top of everything, they are significantly more at risk for contracting COVID and dying from this deadly disease. Once municipal court reopens on November 8th, more than 2,000 households will imminently face eviction. Mothers, children, elderly. Not only is it inconceivable that we would remove people from their homes during a pandemic that has already killed thousands here in Philly, as the weather gets colder, um, but we as a city are not equipped to handle such a high volume of housing insecure individuals and families. I understand and I appreciate the concern for landlords' investments, particularly small landlords who provide the bulk of our affordable housing here in Philly. But there is no question in my mind that we need to focus first on the people who are most immediately at risk of becoming homeless in this situation. We as a legislative body have the power and responsibility to act locally to put protections in place. We have the ability to prevent thousands of our neighbors from losing their homes and from preventing the ripple effect that we'll have throughout our city. And with the EHPA, we have the tools we need to keep people safely housed in the face of this deadly virus that is once again gaining steam. And as we head into winter, which experts suggest will be even more dangerous, it's all the more critical that we act and that we act now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilwoman. She recognized Councilman Green. Thank you, Council President. Um, I want to thank all of my colleagues for their advocacy and their service um, to this body and to the constituents and citizens in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, when I think of service and I also just think of healthy competition, I have to reflect on uh, comments made by Councilmember Thomas in reference to some of the youth groups he was talking about, and and I was listening earlier to um, council member parker talk about the colors of blue and white uh, for the oakland wildcats uh, when i'm surprised you did not mention the colors of red and white for the mount airy bantams um, but that's a conversation um, for another day um, but when i think about those colors um, both red and white and blue and white uh, it makes me think about um, the organizations um, and other organizations that have come together to reach out and provide information regarding voting uh, during this election season. Um, over the years, a number of groups have been brought to city council when we were meeting in person and we've been giving you know, resolutions to various organizations, um, African-American Greek organizations who are based on service. And so many members of this body have been part of those organizations. Uh, when I think of uh, the late councilwoman Augusta Clark was a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. I know she's smiling that one of her sores was nominated as a vice president um, nominee, that being Senator Kamala Harris. And you know, former members of this body that serve in the same sorority as Councilmember Parker, uh, Council Members Tasco and Blindo Reynolds Brown. Um, for me, from my fraternity, Kappa Alpha Psi Incorporated, we've had former uh, mayors. Um, Wilson Good and John Street, as well as Council Member um, George Burrell, and then also uh, my colleague Catherine Gilmer Richardson, who proudly supports uh, the organization Zeta Phi Beta. And I bring this up because um, for the past number of Saturdays in October, we have brought various bleak, Black Greek uh, organizations together to do a Black Greeks Together voter outreach. Uh, we've been doing this every Saturday from the hour of the 12 to 3. Uh, this Saturday will be in the 49th Ward, uh, 6101 North Broad Street. And this initiative started based on some calls I received from some fraternity brothers outside of Pennsylvania who were concerned about voting and voting in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and more importantly in the city of Philadelphia. And so I had a chance to reach out to our city commissioners and saw that in some of our African American wards, we had significant voter drop off from four years and eight years ago during the presidential cycle. Um, wards that have had historically strong turnout, uh, like the 10th ward or the 42nd ward, uh, the 49th ward, the 11th ward, 17th, 48th, 49th, 
52nd. And so we have strategically been doing this outreach at various wards uh, and using shopping centers as a staging area. And so as of last week, we've reached almost 700 households um, by going door to door, letting people know about voter registration, about the mail-in ballot process. I think part of the reason why the turnout has been low in the, in the June primary was because we had only a smaller number of voting locations. Uh, Mail-in voting is still new for many citizens in the city of Philadelphia and also people concerned about uh, COVID-19, which is a pandemic that has gripped every aspect of our lives. Uh, so this Saturday will once again be in the 49th Ward um, between the hours of 12 to 3 um, and getting information out and we'll be at 6101 North Broad Street. So for those fellow members of our Black Greek fraternity organizations and sororities, uh, hopefully you will join us this Saturday. Uh, I want to thank um, all of the members of this body for their service and all of the fraternities and sororities that have come out to support the work that we're doing to demonstrate that service. Um, numerous members of these organizations have been a part of this body. And I think that is an indicia of the type of service that these organizations provide on a daily basis. Why we salute them when we bring them in the city council because of the service they do um, for citizens in this city and around the globe. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilman. Appreciate you all doing that great, great work. Uh, most important election in our, of our lifetimes. Chair recognizes Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I've been getting texts throughout this um, session for me to remind you of the West Philly Monarchs, Parkside Saints, the Wissahickon Braves, which Will Parks, you may have heard of him, Philadelphia Eagle, played for. Uh, and the reason why we don't always, you know, and you started this, uh, Member Thomas, we don't always jump up and down because we've been in the end zone before. And so we're going to be in the end zone again. And so we're, we're just going to let you have your, your little shout outs right now, but you, we will see you again. Um, I want to talk about two events. Uh, the first one is uh, Saturday. It is the 12th annual Block Captain's Boot Camp. Um, due to COVID, this will be our first virtual boot camp. Many of you have um, come through, uh, whether you were at one point a staffer, Kathy, and now you know you get an opportunity to be uh, a member and, and grace uh, those block captains. But I want to give you a little brief history. WRA, Winfield Residents Association, was the first group other than PMB, I mean, uh, the, the uh, Pennsylvania More Beautiful Committee, to advance the idea of training block captains. And we then, 12 years ago, uh, grabbed onto that idea and, and pushed that forward. The reason, I take you back to a day when there was a person on your block, male or female, that somewhat was minding young people's business a little too much. It was irritating at the time, but may have saved your life. They made you clean up on Saturdays. They turned the water plugs on in 90 degree weather and knew which kids were hungry on that block when they put up their grill cooked a hot dog. It didn't even have the regular rolls. It had the uh, Stroman bread with mustard and relish, but made sure those kids were able to eat. Knew about the kids early on that were mischievous and even got in trouble, but was the glue of that block. They were called block cabins. Uh, and we celebrate them once a year. Uh, this year, we empowered them through several workshops. One workshop is block by block security. How to safeguard your block by not jumping out in front of crime, but maybe making a helpful phone call uh, every now and then to prevent crime. Second workshop is school from home. That is going to be a powerful um, workshop. Uh, Evelyn Sample Oates is the moderator to talk about Comcast connectivity to make sure you don't uh, lose it as a 
uh, home school provider and give you the best uh, practices related to that. One of my favorites is going to be the Horticultural Society is going th through a process of building raised beds and doing something, Mr. President, that you support, which is greening of our vacant lots throughout the city uh, and working with the teams that you put together to make them not just clean, but places that you can do outdoor exercises, take recycled materials and make them useful and beneficial uh, to the community. So we're gonna be doing these. We, for the lot captains of the fourth district, we'll be giving um, giveaways. We have masks, PPEs. We have what I really have learned to love in these cleanups is those long reach things that you don't have to pick up with your hands, trash. I, oh, I give those out. They are very popular. And uh, we, we are going to do that. So we encourage all of my uh, members Saturday from 10 to 1 to uh, go to my Facebook and you can get the login information or you can watch it on Channel 64, which is the first time ever we are going to make it public at large. So um, invite your block captains uh, to be empowered by this. The uh, second thing that I want to encourage people to come to is a virtual listening session. And what that is, is that we have a we have two good ballot questions, we hope, and to encourage people to vote yes on. One is uh, Member Johnson's um, Victim Advocacy Office. But the second one is the Citizens Police Oversight Commission that may be established. And we want to get people's opinions about that. So we will be having a listening session um, to get the login information from that. I want you to email samantha.williams, uh, gov to be placed on that um, testimony list. We will be doing that also on channel 64. Uh, that will be uh, at uh, 4.30 to 6.30, October 26, 4.30 to 6.30. And finally, I want to tell you, and sometimes when you're in the middle of a philosophical fight, not good versus evil, but good, better, and best ideas in competition with one another, it, this thing that we do, this uh, representing our people to the best of our ability is a, often a contact sport. But don't take it personal. Remember that we are competing for the best product to be put out for the most people. And you should be passionate about it. You should care deeply when you hear those stories, uh, Member Thomas, Member Richardson, you should feel their pain. But you also should not fall into group therapy. They voted you in for solutions. So we're not just revolutionaries, we are solutionaries. And we are competing for those best practices, those best ideas to be made into public policy. So I encourage you to keep the rumble alive, to keep the debate going. But keep in mind, as um, um, Member Thomas said, I do not doubt one person in this body's intentions to do what they believe is best for their constituents. And so with that, Mr. President, good luck in uh, managing all and refereeing all of those uh, competing ideas. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank, Thank you. You're talking, you're talking about, about, you're talking about staying up at night. Wow. Um, um, <laughs> she recognized Council, Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Council President. And first to my district council member, thank you so much for your work on the Block Captains Boot Camp. It's been my honor to attend the event uh, over the years uh, as a staffer, and I will be honored to attend this year, uh, not only as a member of Winfield Residents Association, uh, but as a member of Philadelphia City Council and your colleague. And I also must say, uh, Council Member Green and Council Member Jones, that as soon as my son turns five, uh, we're going to sign him up for the Parkside Saints. <laughs> 
Um, and also, I just wanted to uh, echo the sentiments of our colleagues relative to uh, Commissioner Perry's retirement from licenses and inspections and from the city of Philadelphia. I just want to thank him so much for all of his work. It's truly been an honor and a privilege to work with him. He is always so very responsive. Uh, he will email you back in the middle of the day or the middle of the night, and I just appreciate all of his work. Uh, so thank you very much, Commissioner Perry. And I also wanted to congratulate uh, our Majority Leader, Councilmember Parker, around the expansion of the PHL uh, TCB program yesterday. Uh, and finally, I wanted to uh, thank all of my colleagues, particularly our colleagues on the, the Housing Committee uh, for their work, especially our uh, Housing Committee Chair, uh, for her willingness to meet with all stakeholders in this process. I am truly appreciative of her efforts uh, because I believe they were successful. Uh, we were able to get to a better space and place uh, for two of the three bills because of her willingness uh, to ensure that everyone can be heard uh, in the process. Uh, but I also want to be clear uh, that uh, the EHPA does not provide direct funding uh, for renters or for landlords, which is why I wanted to uh, address and, addend and add an addendum to the orders of the day around having the administration come on the hearing so we can ensure that we are looking at all possible avenues for individuals to have uh, relief uh, directly uh, for renters and directly for, for landlords. Uh, I think we must remember that all uh, legislation that we introduced in the spring had to be COVID related. The legislation we are deliberating is a result of the challenges our friends and our neighbors are facing uh, as a result of COVID. Uh, what is disheartening for me as someone who knows how this process works since I've been in or around council as a volunteer, an intern or a staffer since 1999 is that some people believe that you can't offer an opinion or a potential solution, talk about those solutionaries, uh, to the process when multiple individuals representing a large variety of people do not agree. As I've learned over the last 21 years, the legislative process is not easy, but we can offer differing opinions to the process, including trying to find more funding for our most vulnerable and not be villainized for trying to represent all Philadelphians, especially our most vulnerable, and trying to come up with solutions that protect all and help to preserve our existing affordable housing. Therefore, I ask and implore my colleagues to understand the legislative process and that it is a process. I want to leave you with three quotes, one by Winston Churchill. If two people agree on everything, one of them is unnecessary. And consensus doesn't happen by magic. You have to drive it. And contrary to what's happening in DC, America is a place where we can all come together. It is a place of consensus. It's not all or nothing. It's what we can accomplish together on behalf of the people that we serve that's most important. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, colleagues. I look forward to our continued work together. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. Count, Councilwoman Gauthier, I see you, you have your hand raised, or is that? All right, it's just showing up on my screen. I have a little hand up. Okay, cool. All right. Oh, that's an accident. Sorry. All right, no problem. No problem. All right, well, thank you all very much, uh, as usual. Uh, we are clearly uh, a very thoughtful council. Uh, which we continue to be thoughtful because at the end of the day, it's not about us, it's about the residents and, uh, of the city of Philadelphia. And we clearly have that in mind as was said earlier. So with that, uh, I'd like to recognize Councilman Jones for a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that council stand adjourned until Thursday, October 29th, 2020 at 10 a.m. Second. Thank you. It has been moving property second to council stand adjourned until Thursday, October 29th, 2020, 10 a.m. All in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. 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 A